All right, welcome everyone to the Game or Die podcast. I am your host, Ryan Moore, and this episode we're going to be talking about some more games that I've been playing. First off, I've been playing a lot more Satisfactory. Satisfactory is one of those games that I very rarely actually engage with. It's a game that I can go back to multiple times and restart and still fall in love with it all over again. Very rarely happens to me. Some games, uh, I don't, I, I very rarely ever actually go and replay through most video games. Why? Probably because in my mind, there's so many different games nowadays, you cannot play every single game released. So I personally like having all those different experiences. And when I play through a game, I've had that experience. Someone like, you know, the completionist, for example, will dig deep into uh, the game that they're playing and they'll mine for every single thing that you can do in that game till you get 100%. You complete everything in that game. Most of the time, I'd say probably, honestly, without exaggerating at all, n over 95% of the time, games don't have anything worthwhile once you finish the game. You're not unlocking better things usually, or if you are, you've already done everything in the game for the most part, especially in the storyline at least, where you're just going back with upgraded weapons and making the game technically easier for you. Uh, something like uh, Saints Row, you know, three or four or whatever, where you get ultimate powers at the end of the game or after you finish the main campaign and you can go back into the game. Well, that's fine. But to what end? What purpose to screw around to have a sandbox? Yeah, that doesn't fly with me. That doesn't that's not an enjoyable experience for me. I know a lot of people who would play, you know, Grand Theft Auto and just never finish the actual story or barely even start the story. And they would play hundreds of hours of that game where it was just sandbox screwing around, blowing things up, killing hookers and all that fun stuff. But very rarely for me is that ever actually enjoyable past a few, you know, minutes or maybe an hour or something like that. After that, it's like, what am I doing with my time? I'm not completing the objectives. I'm not seeing story. I'm not seeing anything new. It's just replaying the same thing over and over and over again. So I opted for, or I opt for, you know, once I finish a game, if there's something truly spectacular, I will go back and finish it or, or not finish it, but go back and play through more of it and get some of the side quests, but that's very few and far between. So all of that to say, I very rarely ever replay games or play games more than once or restart games. And that's where Satisfactory comes in for me. Satisfactory was one of those games that it is still in early access. It's not finished. There's no way to complete the game as of yet. And I've dumped hun uh, over 100 hours into that game at this point. Why? Because I like it. I enjoy it. It's a very relaxing game for me to be able to sit there, come up with an idea, and then execute it. Whether that's just building a simple factory or getting the parts I need to ship off to the space shuttle or whatever. So I was playing this game earlier this week. I was playing Satisfactory, and I went to this one area that I've never explored before. And unfortunately, I didn't realize this until way later on, but there's one world in Satisfactory. You are on the same level. Even if you restart at the very beginning of the game, you have a couple different selections of what to play. You can play in the forest, you can play in the desert, and I thought those were different worlds. They don't really explain, hey, it's the same level. You're just starting in different locations of the same level. And you'll get to them all eventually if you explore, go exploring enough. I didn't realize that. So <laughs> over the last year and a half since the game's been out, I've been playing this game uh, and f stopping for whatever reason, then picking it up a couple of months later and restarting the entire game from zero because I was like, well, I want to check out the desert world. I want to check out the forest world. 
not realizing they're at the same exact area. It's just difficulty of how hard resources are to find. So the very beginning, you know, um, if in forest area, you have, it's uh, a medium difficulty where some of the resources are uh, spread out a little bit. The desert is really hard, so there's a lot of hard to get to places where the resources are very hard to get to and very sparse. And then there's like the plains area where everything's right there for you to get started. I didn't realize that until this last playthrough. So um, I started up again and I'm having a blast. I'm really enjoying it. I got to I put about 35 hours into the game and I needed to find oil. So I started searching for oil. I finally found it connected, built all the factories for oil, started connecting everything, I'm sitting there just building stuff after like a few hours. And then all of a sudden my power goes out. I broke a circuit. I'm like, what, what is going on? So I spent like three hours backtracking, trying to turn off different parts of my factory because I had a bunch of different coal power producing factories in one area of the map and that was it. And then I needed to figure out all of those, those factories were set up to one power grid and the power grid supplies power to the entire world of what I've explored and where I've built everything, which is everywhere. So I had to basically not just backtrack, but look around on every part of the level that I've been to before, go to the little factory areas where I'm mining either coal or copper or sandstone or limestone you know, stuff like that and try to figure out what is, what is causing the issue that took forever. And at some point I went back to my power grid area and it was just a mess because the way that I play that game is efficient as possible, not prettiest, not as nice looking as possible, but just put the thing down so I can get started so that I it can just kind of be left on and then I can move on to the next thing. I don't care what it looks like. After being on the subreddit for this game for, you know, a long time and always seeing people's factories look amazing, I finally decided, you know what? There's got to be a better way to do this. It, it's got to be more efficient if I have everything laid out easily so that I can kind of get a mental or not even a mental a actual picture of what my factories look like, how much power I have going to this grid in a very easy to understand way and to be able to create more and expand without just having a factory up on a hill and a factory down in the valley and factory right next to a, a water extractor. So <laughs> I deleted everything of my power grid, my power producing factory and restarted completely. And man, it took a while, but now I have something so cool looking. I have, um, basically there's this valley where there's a, a lake and in the lake, I have a single catwalk going across the lake. And on each side, I have water extractors going into one singular pipe that goes up straight up into the sky for about, you know, like a couple hundred meters. And then in that area, there is a big, long, expansive um, field of just flat produced ground uh, um, foundation, just kind of floating in the sky or whatever, you know, there's like a ramp to it. And then I have one coal factory producing and just mining coal, an infinite amount of coal, and sending that out to all these coal factories. And the water goes into those coal factories, and the coal goes into those coal factories through pipes and conveyor belts. And it is split off, so I have five on the right, five on the left, five in another quadrant, and it is just ever-expanding as much as I want to now because it's laid out properly. And it's really, really cool. I'm finally getting to the point in my gameplay where I'm kind of nearing the end of the update because like I said, it's uh, in early access still. They're still building it. So the game's not completed yet. 
So once I hit that, you know, milestone of, hey, I finished this part. Now there's nothing to complete until the next update comes out. I'm starting to spend a little bit more time making my factories actually look nice and make everything laid out well. And it's really fun. I really, really enjoy it. I think um, that game is phenomenal for a bunch of different reasons. I'm also having a blast because I am just using it as a cool down nighttime game. I'm not trying to complete any real objectives because like I said, you know, I'm kind of nearing the end of the update. So I'm kind of just putting everything on hold and playing it as a creative type of game. A lot of people call like Minecraft and stuff like that, where you just kind of create to be creative. That's kind of where I am at with Satisfactory. There's still goals. There's still reasons why I'm doing the things in the game that I'm doing, because it's all going to build up so that I have a stack when the next update drops. I can just grab this from here, this from here, and this from here, combine it all, and send it off into space, and bam, my objective's complete. Instead of having to go find all this stuff and then wait for the resources and have it take forever, it's like, bam, it's all right there. I've dumped enough hours into the game where I've gotten everything I've wanted out of it. And now I'm just kind of continually getting bonus enjoyment out of the game. So I've been playing a lot of that. And then my wife has been playing Ark and she really wants me to get into it. And I don't know if I really want to or not, but we got Game Pass again because it was on Game Pass and she could play with her brother on uh, online. So I was going through Game Pass and going, man, is there anything that I can play? Because I don't really have anything else that I want to play. But, you know, we're paying for this and there's a ton of games here I can play. What is there? And so I actually found a game that I played back in 2005 called Destroy All Humans. Last year, they did a remastered version of it for the newer consoles and... I wanted it, but I'm not going to pay 40 bucks for the game. <laughs> so it was on Game Pass. I'm like, dude, this is technically kind of like almost free. So I'm going to retry and play this game because I remember getting to a point in that game originally in 2005, right before the 360 came out and just dropping it because I kind of got frustrated with the game itself. There was a point where I just could not progress because I was having too much difficulty pe uh, with uh, the enemies. Um, coming at me and killing me before I could, f you know, finish the mission. So I loaded it back up and I immediately remembered why I was initially turned off by the game. The character. So if you don't know what Destroy All Humans is, it's a very campy B movie type of video game. It's a B game in every sense of the word. It's a budget game. It's a game that doesn't have the full force of a studio's budget behind it or money behind it. They're just making games to push them out the door. It's not what a lot of people call triple A. It's just kind of a video game. And so there was a lot of these back in the the time where you would have this middle tier of game. It wasn't shovelware. It wasn't an indie game because indie games didn't really exist at that time either. And it wasn't, you know, the flagship products of studios. It was just the, ah, we have a couple other teams. Let's give it to them. Let's give them this project. And this will come out in the meantime, while our a team is actually building the new game that we're going to shove out during Christmas and, and promote and market heavily. So destroy all humans came out. And what this game really is, is like Mars attacks. It's a campy game where you are the alien in an alien invasion of earth. It kind of flips that whole like alien invasion of Earth and you want to be the you know army and uh, all everyone has to come together on Earth to uh, repel the invading uh, invasion. Uh, but this man, it's really interesting because basically what it does is it allows you to have fun. It knows it's goofy. It's got a lot of silly uh, weapons but you're supposed to have fun with them. The only issues are uh, right off the bat, you kind of hate the main character. And the reason why is because he is a caricature 
or he does a really bad Jack Nicholson impression. He talks like this. Oh, man, come on. And it's just like, wow, that is one of the worst Jack Nicholson impressions I've ever heard. And when I originally played that game, I hated it. I didn't I started skipping cutscenes, cutscenes, I believe, because I hated the character so much. You never want to hate the main character you're playing as in a game. So I really hated that part. The main leader that you kind of report to, who is your guy in the ear um, throughout the entire game, he is voiced by the guy who does Raz for Psychonauts or also Invader Zim. So this is basically Invader Zim, the game. You are trying to conquer the Earth and the voice of Invader Zim is telling you how to do that. And so that was really cool. I, I really liked that. And the art style of this game is really fun, too. It's set in the 1950s, and it has this really weird art style to the main characters, this aesthetic of rubbery, rubbery, plasticky humans, almost like the Point Break masks, you know, like the Nixon and, and uh, Reagan masks and stuff like that. It has this weird caricature of you know, people exaggerated noses and cheekbones and teeth and smiles. And everyone, because of the time frame of when those games were coming out, all the characters always looked rubbery and plasticky to begin with. But there's like this artificial bloom on their skin where it just shines like plastic. And it's kind of creepy and off putting in a way but it's still really fun and enjoyable. It doesn't take itself seriously to the point where it's like, hey, this is a game about an alien invasion where you play as the alien. You are going around destroying buildings. You are going through and using disintegrator rays and blowing buildings up. And it's all in jest. It's fun. It is very tongue in cheek. And so I played through the game and I got to the part where I got stuck at and I, I moved on from it and I was having a really, really good time. So when I got to a certain section in the game, I realized I wasn't getting the upgrades that I needed. And there's upgrades in this game where you can upgrade your abilities, your gun, and uh, also your spaceship, your flying saucer with better versions of the weapons you have or when you unlock new ones and stuff like that. So I realized I wasn't getting the upgrades that I needed to kind of progress through the game. There is an option that allows you to go explore the city or the level that you're in because you are in levels of a city. It is not fully 100% open world. It's a open-ish world or an open town. <laughs> versus an open world. And I really wish that they would have opened it up a little bit more. And what I mean by that is not that it would have expanded. It would have allowed you to deviate during the actual mission itself because you have two parts to this game. You have the missions and you have the open world aspect to it. And they are separated by menus. It's a real big bummer because I would have done part of the mission or started and then when exploring for a little bit come back and and do a mission and then go explore a little bit and then come back and finish the mission i would have done that but you're not allowed to really i mean theoretically technically you can but you're on kind of some timers and uh certain areas do have uh restriction zones and things like that i never played the sequel to it because i'd never finished the first game and I'm a big fan of, hey, if there's a sequel to a game, you should probably play it in order and play the first one, finish it, and then get to the second one. Uh, very rarely do I ever deviate from that. One of the times was Witcher 3, where I played a little bit of the second game, uh, and that was it. <laughs> and then I went directly into 3. And it sucks because I want to go back and play Witcher 1 and 2, 
but they are very different games at this point. And it is really hard to go back to those games because they play so differently. And I have my mind set on what a Witcher game is, or at least turned into afterwards. But going back to that first game is really, really tough. Going back to the second game isn't as bad, but it's definitely not as polished as the third one. So I don't know if they advanced any of that type of stuff or, or cleaned it up or made it a little bit easier to go explore because there's collectibles and there's different ways that you can earn or accrue the currency, which is like DNA in this game. You can't accrue that very easily playing the actual missions in the story part of the game. You get that by exploring at your leisure the open town that they give you during those missions. So kind of a little bit of a bummer. Um, but again, you know, this is just a several years out from GTA 3. It's at the time there weren't as many of those types of games as there is now. And it didn't, it wasn't as advanced as it is now. So I totally get it. I understand it. It's just kind of a bummer that it's not there. I hope, I hope that the third game uh, or the second game in the series uh, expands on that and it allows me to just explore a little bit more. So I got past the area that I was stuck at originally on the original Xbox when I played it. And there was definitely a few times where I got mad. <laughs> not, I'm not even going to lie and say frustrated. Uh, I was straight up pissed at some points in this game because there is just a few moments, just a couple boss fights and um, what is the what is that type of tower to tower defense type of gameplay that just gets thrown into the game out of nowhere. And it is very unforgiving. They checkpoint you at pretty awful spots and it becomes very, very frustrating in the way that it becomes unfair in a way. It is a huge, massive difficulty spike. And the way that you play through this, the, the enemies are bullet sponges in most cases, and you don't have a lot of uh, ammo. You have a option to transmogrify um, things in the world, but it's only certain things and it's kind of hard to find. So there was this one, the, the first time I got really upset was there was this random part where you have tower defense. You have these two radio or TV antennas that you have to defend. Uh, against the actual USA army that is coming after you, not with just um, army men and uh, tanks, but also mechs as well. So you're trying to fight off wave after wave after wave, and you're in this very tiny area. Um, you are pretty slow for the most part. You have a jetpack that you can get around in, which is, makes it a little bit easier. But you have to target and transmogrify objects like crates, wooden crates in the world to get ammo. But you can only transmogrify one thing at a time and transmogrifying stuff takes like five seconds. So I, I'm running around, I have enemies shooting at me, I hit transmogrify and then I wait, one, two, three, four, five. Now I have ammo. And then you have to switch your guns, which... When it's frantic, it is a lot harder because it does the <clears throat> power wheel from Mass Effect, but it doesn't stop time. It just slows it down slightly. It's not even like in Mass Effect where it slows it down super, super, super slow. It's like, yeah, I'm kind of playing in slow motion a little bit, but you're in a menu. You can't shoot. You can't move. And you have to figure out which weapon has what ammo. And it just became a chore. And it was really frustrating because they don't give you a lot of time. You're completely surrounded. And that's like halfway through the game. Then there's a couple boss fights which just felt tiring. They're like 15 minute boss fights. And you're constantly running around. You barely have life. There's It's very hard to, you have to hide. I don't know why they made it this way, but it, 
it just got frustrating at a point. And then it does what a lot of those games did back in the day where it just drags out the ending. <clears throat> it drags out the ending to the point where you think it's over and it's not. And then you think it's over and it's not. And then you think it's over and it's not. So at the point where I got to the actual final boss, after you beat this huge mech for what feels like ever, <laughs> and you are just constantly evading attack after attack after attack, barely holding on with a sliver of life left, you have another boss fight. And it's like, come on. So I finally got to this final, 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 final boss fight. And it is just as difficult as the boss fight before it. It doesn't let up. It's even more difficult somehow. And they don't really help you or give you hints or a strategy on how to actually beat it. Because, again, the boss fight takes so long and there's multiple. So and the boss fight is basically big health bar at the top of the screen and three lightning bolts. Those three lightning bolts basically are... Um, containers for a life bar. So you have a life bar and you drop one down you have another life bar and drop one down and then they have the last life bar. So you have to basically kill and drop down their life bar three separate times and they're in phases. So you finally figure out how to get the first phase down. You still have to deal with two more phases. And you finally figure out the second uh, phase and you're on the third phase and the th third phase is always the hardest. So you die. And then you got to do the whole entire boss fight over there. I tried it. I attempted it probably about five times. It took me like 45 minutes to beat the stupid boss because I would get the health bar down and then die, get the health bar down twice and then die, get the health bar down two and a half times and then die. And each one time I died, I had to restart from the beginning. It doesn't checkpoint you in the middle of a phase. Which, this might just be me complaining about the game, and so why stop being a big baby about it, but, dude, when you're done, and you're tired, and you just want to finish the game, and you know you can, and the only reason you haven't is because you don't have time to figure out the strategy of the boss fight, that's where I get frustrated, and that's where I f feel like it becomes unfair. If you gave me a little bit of time to play around with the boss and figure out its movement pattern and, and attack pattern, yeah, I wouldn't have a problem with that because I know, okay, this is when this happens. This is when this happens. But when you are constantly running around like a chicken with your head cut off, barely able to stay alive, and you're more focused on trying to stay alive than you are trying to focus on attacking or def uh, offense versus defense it becomes really frustrating. So I finally did finish it. I actually had to put it down. I, I got really, really upset and <laughs> I had to put it down for a little bit, um, hang out with my wife. She calmed me down. And then, uh, once she went to bed, I uh, attempted it one last time and bam, right away I, I finished it. So always taking that time to take a step back. And when and she's really good about this. When she sees me getting frustrated or angry at a game, she's like, you need to stop. You need to take a break. And I hate when she says that, but it's super true. When I do take a break, I always have a little bit of more clarity and a clearer mindset going into the battle once again. So, man, uh, <laughs> it's really nice to be able to have someone say, you know what, maybe, maybe just take a step back a little bit. So... I did play that, and then I moved on to a new game that I bought last night, Stubbs the Zombie, another 2005 game that got randomly released out of kind of nowhere, and I remember playing this on the Xbox, I never finished it, and now I remember why. It's a bad game, and when I say a bad game, I mean it's a boring bad game. There's not much to it. I bought it for on sale for five bucks and I basically probably won't finish it. That's just five bucks that I wasted to play about 45 minutes of a game. And the reason why is because 
the game itself just has nothing going for it. You have these massive, huge landscapes in the game and world, but they are barren. They are straight up empty. Stubbs the zombie, guess what? You're a zombie. So it's kind of like Destroy All Humans and uh, you play as the zombie, not the other way around like most games. So it's really interesting to be able to see. And I remember when the game came out, it's made by Bungie and it was more of a I don't know what it actually was. I don't know if it was actually a tech demo, um, kind of like the Atlas thing where they said, oh, we're going to, or Rockstar thing where we're going to do um, this table tennis game so that we can um, get used to the uh, developing environment of the hardware. I don't know if that was the case for this because this came out after Halo. So they already worked on Halo. Or at least I believe it's the Bungie engine, like the Halo engine that it was built upon. But man, this game just kind of is, it's boring. It's really empty. The remaster did a really bad job of mixing the audio. So one speaker has, you know, the audio coming in out of it. And it's way, way too loud than what it should be. Um, some definitely uh, audio repeats or gets stuck. I don't know what's happening. Uh, my dog's going crazy. So the audio gets stuck. I just, it's it's really, really weird. So the game itself is not just empty from a landscape and just a broad view of everything off in the distance is all in the distance and it takes forever to get there because you're shambling the entire time but when you do get there the whole game's audio is just empty there's nothing it's silence it's like this yeah you want to play a game that sounds like this right no no one does you need some ambient environment um, audio going and there's nothing there and what a huge bummer too is this game actually had a really cool soundtrack it's a soundtrack made by modern bands at the time covering old 1950 songs so like my boyfriend's back um rebel without a uh, cause um uh, mr sandman all of those like sweet poppy 1950s um rock and roll songs we're all covered by modern bands, but that's not in the game. That was just the game's soundtrack that they produced outside of the game. So not having any of that music in the game itself, too, is just it's a real big bummer. It's very goofy too, it like childish goofy in a way. Um, the characters motivations don't really make sense, like even with destroy all humans, like there was enemies that just felt like, oh, they're they're trying to come. They're trying to defeat this alien. Some of them don't recognize this an alien or some of them do and they scream and run away. But they run away in a like normal fashion, like they run and hide and stuff with Stubbs the zombie. They flail their arms about and they all have the same single animation. Every character has the same single animation for running and it looks cheap that's what i think one of the biggest issues with this game is it looks and feels very cheap like it was thrown out the door without any polish whatsoever on it and i've only played 45 minutes and i honestly don't think i have it in me to finish a seven hour campaign of that game it is way too long uh, for what that game is. And I know the game doesn't really improve upon it all that much. So eh, I, I might play more of it. I might not. I'm not sure. <sighs> so that's what I've been playing. And I'm going to talk about something that uh, came up yesterday. I have been following this website called Giant Bomb for oh, let's see since 2011 roughly i tried following them a few years earlier but i never really got into them i watched a few videos i never really liked what they were doing at the time but back in 2011 i really got into their game of the year stuff and 
since then, I've been a literally daily viewer. So this is basically about 10 years of my life that I've been following on a daily basis, this group of people who play video games and talk about video games and put up videos about video games, mainly for the most part. So over the last several, uh, several years, uh, they have been, what's the kind way to say this? Uh, basically really doing a poor job of what they say they are about. They've made some really bad hiring decisions. They've made some really poor um, decisions on a business front. They've been bought and sold several times in the time that I've been watching them. And yesterday, they announced that the out of the six people left at that gaming website, three or half of them are leaving. And they've been there since the beginning, basically, or roughly the beginning. So I have had this discord that I've been um, managing for a couple months now, and we all talk in there and we're all very, we, we are fans or were fans of Giant Bomb. We really enjoyed what they used to do, but they have gone so far off the deep end in, in things that we don't agree with or whatever that we all just kind of um <laughs> we we kind of talk crap a little bit about it but in a loving way the fact that we used to love this site we used to want to you know everything uh about that site used to be awesome it, we pay for that site and that's really the big issue here is that we've been paying a subscription fee for this website and when we see something that we don't like, we should be able to have an opinion or a voice on the matter saying, hey, I don't like this. But over the years, you're not allowed to anymore. The forum itself has been uh, completely obliterated with a few people who will shut down any conversation at all that they don't agree with. Not that some of those po uh, posters who get banned deserve it because, I mean, there's definitely a lot of people who come in there and just uh, are jerks and, you know, say extremely vile and disgusting, horrible things about uh, human beings uh, in general, you know, and it's the whole Internet and anonymity, an anonymity thing <laughs> where no one, everyone can say whatever they want because there's no one, uh, no one could touch them. I can say whatever I want and no one's going to really do anything about it because you can't because either you're anonymous or it's the internet. Well, there's no internet police. So the forums on their official website, they don't, they don't, uh, the staff themselves don't do anything about it's just all run by fans at this point. And if the fan moderators don't like you, uh, they have full reign and control to make you um, banned or uh, uh, non-existent on that forum. Same thing with the subreddit and a couple other websites. So we were part of a forum and that forum got banned too. And so I started up this discord and we've been talking about it. And yesterday the news broke that half of the staff or three of the six people uh, that have been there since basically the beginning are gone. And what that means for the website is anyone's guess because Giant Bomb doesn't tell anyone anything. They are super, super secretive about every single aspect of their jobs and no one can question it. And it's really weird and strange, especially when it's a product that is being sold and people are buying it. They're buying a subscription to this website and that should allow us to say, if we are buying this subscription, we should be able to know what's happening on behind the scenes just a little bit. I'm not saying I need to know every single thing of every single day of what's happening, but when a video game or a website that you subscribe to puts out less and less and less and less content and the quality of that very little content drops dramatically from it used to be amazing to this isn't even worth my time of even hitting the play button. We should be able to ask why and no one can do that. So when the news hit, 
the uh, gaming forums and internet kind of uh, went off the deep end and rails and it was just a madhouse discussion. And the issue really is this all could have been avoided or not avoided, but at least it could have been have a little bit of damage control. They could have been prepared, but they've shown time and time again that they don't either like doing that or they're incapable of doing that. I don't think that they're incapable of doing that. I think anyone is capable of saying, hey, let's plan out um, uh, this because this is going to be a big, big deal to a lot of people. A lot of people view these people as friends, you know, to be honest, it's weird, <laughs> but, uh, they view them as friends. If you've been watching someone for 10 years, I mean, look at anyone who watches a TV show that's been on the air for 10 years. And then that final season finale or series finale, there's people who view that as like, Oh, my friends are going away, which yeah, probably unhealthy, but I get the idea of it. So it all could have been really handled a lot better by just talking, which is something that they do not do ever. They have a newsletter that you can sign up for. That newsletter consists of not what you think it would. It consists of cooking recipes, anecdotes about um, other businesses like wrestling or um, a story of I went to the mall and I bought some Pokemon cards. It deals with pretty much everything other than what a newsletter should be. What's happening with the site? What's happening in the coming weeks or months of content that you're subscribing and paying for? So when they announced we're leaving, everyone went, oh crap, what does that mean? And the answer was a resounding uh, we'll let you know. Like, really? Really? We'll let you know? No, I'm paying for the subscription. I want to know what's happening. Or I'm pulling my subscription. Or I'm not subscribing anymore. Or I'm canceling. Like, and us as consumers have the right to do that. It's not cancel culture because we don't just say we don't like what you're doing. We say we don't want to subscribe to something that we're not sure of. I don't know where my money is going at this point. I unsubscribed to the website several months ago when I was just fed up with the absolute lowest of low quality, zero effort, complaining from the staff saying their jobs are so difficult and hard when all they do is literally, because they, they'll fully admit, they sit at their house all day, every day, because they're in quarantine still for whatever stupid reason. Um, and they think the apocalypse is going on outside. So they haven't left their houses in months. They've admitted to that. I don't know how true that is today as of a recording, but you know, in the last several months, they've basically said, we don't go outside. So what do you do at that point when you have this group of people who say, we don't go outside of our houses and they put out maybe two or three hours of, of actual content, like gameplay um, per week out of six people, a 40 hour work week. Like it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's really uh, crazy that people would say that's acceptable. I'm paying for that. Now I will say the subscription to the website is $50 for a full year, $50 for 365 full days of content and back catalog. That's all fine and good. That's nothing, especially when you get it on sale like I did and, and stack it over a yeah, course of a couple of years. What I did is back in, I, I want to say 2017 or 18, I subscribed and on, on sale for $35 for a year and bought like three years. So mine is uh, up in two days from now um, for 2021. And a couple months ago, I said, you know what? I, I'm just done. I'm done subscribing. I don't want to even be auto renewed or anything like that. Cancel my subscription. I got an email saying you've been canceled or you've canceled your subscription. You have access to the site until uh, 
the day that your subscription would normally end. I'm not getting any pro rates. I'm not getting any money back, which I'm fine with. I, you know, like I said, it, at that point, it would be like three, five bucks, maybe <laughs> something like that. So I, I don't care about that. But I don't want to give my money and show my support to a company who doesn't view me or the, the audience or fans as anything other than a pocketbook. And they're not even that. They're a corporation at that, this point. They have been bought and sold a couple times by a couple different corporations. They don't get their money from subscribers. They get their money from the company that bought them. So they don't really have an incentive to actually put forth any real effort like a lot of people do on the internet. Twitch, view, uh, Twitch streamers, YouTubers, they beg and beg for their money because they know the only way that they're going to get money is by asking for it and by making a ton of content and working their butts off. And then you have this group of ex, and they're not game journalists anymore. They used to be, but that was over 10 years ago. The Giant Bomb website is strictly, they hate saying they're game journalists because they don't want to be lumped into that category because they're not either. They don't write articles. They don't write reviews anymore. They don't do anything that, re, that would make you think that they're a journalist they play games online sometimes. They have a podcast or two that sometimes delves a little bit into games, but mostly covers the gaming industry news. That's really what they are at the core of it. They are a game news coverage website. And at this point, I'm just done with their excuse after excuse. They say that they have meetings all the time. But we don't know what those meetings actually entail. They've never said anything other than we've had meetings. They said before the pandemic, before everyone started working from home, they said, we want to work from home on Mondays so that we can use those Mondays to prepare for content. But nothing resulted from that. There was no shift in more content or better quality content when they started, quote unquote, working from home on Mondays. I don't know about you, but when someone says, I'm working from home, I don't believe them. <laughs> uh, I believe that they do the bare minimum. They're in their PJs. They're, you know, uh, walking and having two hour long lunch breaks. They'll put a Zoom call on. And they'll do the bare minimum. Honestly, when, when you don't have people supervising, when you don't have someone watching, when you have a lazy employee, they will try and get away with everything they can. So I see that on a daily basis from this website, from every single one of them. I do believe that they think that they're doing good. I do believe that they think that they are putting out good content, but the actual people who are paying and watching the content disagree a lot. There are groups of the internet or groups of, of this uh, fan base that completely disagree with me, but there is a larger and larger majority that are starting to agree with me. The website isn't showing that they're trying at all. They continually make excuses for leaving the video early. Some, like literally the boss goes on their Friday stream. I'm sorry, guys, I got to go. I got to wash my child, like give them a bath. This is their Friday work day. You cannot just get up and go home and go give your kid a bath because you have a kid. That excuse doesn't fly. You don't just get to get up and leave work because you have other things to do. No, you're at work. Shut up, sit down and do your job. And their job is to play video games and they can't even do that. So I don't have a lot of remorse. I don't have a lot of pity or empathy or sympathy or anything like that for them. And now they have a lot of people pulling their subscriptions over the last several weeks or months. They have a lot of people donating for them uh, to give them a lot more uh, 
money just because like uh, I saw some people saying tip jar and stuff like that. I think that's ridiculous, but it just sucks to be honest. It's, it's a real big bummer that the website went the way that it did because back in 2011 to honestly, 2017, the website was fantastic. It was really fun and enjoyable. And I would tell everyone about the website. I would constantly be going, man, you got to check out giant bomb. They're great. You know, people would say, oh, this Twitch streamer, this YouTuber. And I'm like, dude, yeah, they're, they're kind of a fine, whatever, but dude, check out this group of people. They're really enjoyable to listen to. They know what they're talking about, about video games. They explain things in a great way. Uh, they're very passionate about video games. And they're not hawking and slinging their product every day of the week. That's what I really can't stand about Twitch streamers and YouTubers. Uh, all the phony canned verbiage, like, comment, and subscribe, shout out this and that, uh, the, subs uh, the um, uh, sponsor for today is, you know, Squarespace. Like, come on. At that point, you're a marketing person. You're marketing and slinging products so that you can do what you want, which, I mean, some might just say that boils down to every job ever, but, you know, like, Giant Bomb would do that once a year on a podcast for, like, 30 seconds. They would say, yeah, if, you're, you're, um, if you haven't subscribed, you're, you're missing out on a lot of great content that is behind a paywall, and I originally didn't subscribe for, like I said, I, I listened 2013 or 2011, didn't subscribe till 2013 because I wasn't sure if that content was going to be good or not. There was no free trial or anything like that back then. So I just took a dive on a sale of 35 bucks when I didn't have the money, you know, every single day I was, um, not working a ton. So that $35 was like a kind of, um, uh, a big hope and a wish saying, I hope this works out. And I was so pleasantly surprised by all the back catalog that I got to look at and watch over the years, all the new stuff on a almost daily basis. Very rarely did they ever, they never put out anything on week weekends. They very rarely ever put stuff out on Monday, but the rest of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday was several hours a day of really enjoyable video game stuff, which is my hobby. That's why, I mean, that's why I'm doing this podcast is because I loved it so much that I want to listen to other people talk about games the way that I talk about games. That's why I enjoyed Giant Bomb. And when they just started going further and further away from video games and caring and talking about them and playing them even just in general they go every month or every tuesday when they would come to the bomb cast and talk about what they've been playing it was always like eh, i didn't have time what do you mean you didn't have time it's your job what are you doing <laughs> if you don't what oh we have meetings like uh you have meetings for 35 hours a week no you don't you have meetings on Mondays from nine to five. No, you don't. You should be playing games at that point. So if you do, and if you are, what have you been playing and talk about it? And it would always be like the same single game. And it would never be in this is I'm talking about now, nowadays in the last several years, it would always be like some very vague, shallow description of the game, never delving deep. And it was always one single person just describing the game to the, uh, the rest of the group. I know I do that on my podcast, but that's only because it's just me <laughs> talking to the audience. It is not me talking to a group of peers or coworkers. And that's unacceptable when you, your entire basis of your job is to play and talk about video games, the entire staff or the majority of the staff should be playing the same game so that they can all talk about their same ex or different experiences. That's what I liked about it when originally when I subscribed, it was, oh man, well, Jeff had this experience and then Brad had this experience and then Patrick had this experience. They all had different experiences with the game. 
now you can you couldn't you literally couldn't pay them enough to play the same game as each other anymore because they've proven that they have been paid to play games and talk about it online. That is the majority of what their job entails. I think we can all agree on that. And then you come to the podcast and they say, what have you been playing? And it's nothing, or I didn't have time, or one person out of seven or eight or 10 or 12 at one point, one person out of all of those have played a single brand new, huge, big triple A game that is game of the year. Oh, and let's talk about game of the year for a second. So game of the year is one of the biggest time for a lot of gaming podcasts because it's when everyone gets together um, during the holidays. They talk about the entire year of games. What was the best? What was the worst? There's lists, there's videos. And over the last several years, those discussions became more and more boring, less frequent, Mo- many didn't play the same games or it, any at all. And then this last year, they basically said, we didn't have time to play video games while we were stuck at home being paid to play video games. So we're going to, we are going to push back our game of the year until after the new year. In late January, we're going to put out our game of the year podcast. So everyone said, all right, they need some more time to play video games, even though they've had the entire year to sit at home and they've been paid to do exactly what they said they haven't been doing. So whatever, we'll wait and and see how it goes. And what it amounted to was the same thing. Most of them didn't play the same games. A few of them tried to play, but they didn't have the time because they tried cramming all of, you know, about 10 different games, all requiring multiple hours or dozens of hours to a couple weeks. That doesn't, you can't do that. And if you do somehow cram for that, you're going to end up hating those games, which is exactly what happened. So the game of the year, they said, oh, we didn't have time to produce content. We didn't have to. All they did was hit record and hit end. A few years ago, they had skits. They had um, activities. They had tons of, of fun, enjoyable things. And the year that they had more time than ever to be as creative as they wanted to amounted in the lowest effort. And when I say that, I'm not using it as a hyperbole or meme speak or anything like that. It was zero amount of work ethic effort to actually do the job that they're paid to do during one of their biggest times of the entire year. They have two big points in the year. E3 in June and game of the year. E3 didn't happen last year because of the pandemic. Totally get it. But they could have had guests on. They didn't do that. They could have done uh, gameplay footage of, you know, demos that they got access to. They didn't do that. They could have played games of uh, older versions of games in a series where new games of the series got announced. They didn't do that. They could have um, had night shows where they had guests on you know, from different studios or executives from companies. They didn't do that. They didn't do anything. And then the game of the year is the other big point, which like I just described, they literally said, well, we're going to hit record and start talking about some games with very, very, very shallow uh, in-depth discussions and then hit end. And that's our uh, game of the year content. And we worked so hard on it. You guys, you don't know. You, You don't even know the half of how hard we worked to uh, put this together. From the actual video output of the end product, it doesn't seem like they had any effort put into it at all. I would, I would defy someone to tell me that they did because they didn't. They can lie to themselves and the fans all they want, but people can tell 
And they always say their job is so hard. Well, guess what? It's not. You play video games online on the internet for a living. For a living. They literally get paid to do that stuff. Do they have meetings? I'm sure they do. I'm honestly sure they have meetings. How many and for how long? Probably not as much as they say. So the website is, so they say, still going to happen, still around, still going to function. But it's only functioning on three people. One is the founder and two are uh, video producers that uh, have... Most people don't find their personalities very attractive, which a giant bomb is a video game website built on personalities. They themselves say th say this. So <laughs> it is something that seems like it is not planned out, not thought out of what they're going to do. They say they're going to come up with uh, more information later on this week or next week. That's literally a tweet saying um, we'll let you know. Sometime this week, dot, 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 or, or next week. They can't even commit to their subscribers, their paying customers to give them an, uh, a heads up on what's going to happen to the site. So everyone's just left speculating. And then they all have the audacity to say, don't speculate. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Well, yeah, because you won't tell us. Maybe if there was some communication at all. Last time any one of their um, any one of their people posted on their own forums was like two years ago or six months ago or whatever. There's zero effort into it. It is a sinking ship that has been going is sinking for a long, 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 long time. And people are finally opening their eyes to go, oh, wow, it's actually pretty bad over there. <laughs> and it sucks. You know, I'm not happy about it. I am straight up not happy that this website that I've devoted to my personal time to over and over and over again throughout the uh, years, daily watching videos, listening to podcasts. I mean, some of my favorite memories in the car are from listening to those podcasts on uh, road trips or uh, work trips and things like that. It's gotten me through a lot. But I'm not going to give them a pass saying, oh, my gosh, you guys had it so hard. Oh, man, bravo, bravo. Thank you so much. No, I would have said that five years ago when I felt like my opinion was validated. I wasn't treated like dirt. Their own staff that they hired has, it would continually bag on the fans and say how terrible they are and say, F you, we don't care what you think. Literally said that. In a, <laughs> in a uh, PAX event. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm i bummed that they went out like they did. I don't believe that that site will go on very much longer. I believe it will for a next month or two. Uh, but I believe it will really just close up shop in the next couple of months here. And it's a bummer, but I made my peace with it long ago. I made my peace with Giant Bomb kind of dying uh, long ago. It's not the same company that it used to be and it hasn't been that way for a long time. So I just wanted to air that out a little bit because I felt like I needed to talk about it because not just because it's a big thing in the gaming industry, which it totally is. You know, there was an article on Kotaku uh, yesterday about it. I remember when Kotaku broke the news of Ryan Davis dying and that actually hit me a lot harder than uh, <laughs> the news yesterday did. I went, oh, wow. Huh. Looks like looks like the site's finally dying. Not that it wasn't already. It's now that it's it's kind of more official. So I just want to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> I know most people don't care, but that's my opinion on everything. It's it's a bummer. But hey, Giant Bomb was a part, huge part of uh, my life and my yeah, a huge part of my gaming life. They really did influence me on uh, a lot of uh, gaming trends and things that I liked and uh, turned me on to a lot of different games that I never would have uh, thought I liked. One of my favorite um, things that my wife and I both watched were the uh, contradiction streams that they did. This FMV game about a detective in London who is trying to solve a murder. Man, if you haven't played or watched Contradiction, Spot the Liar, go do it. It's rad. It's a really good game. 
we sat up one night and watched the entire playthrough and it's like a seven hour game. <laughs> and we just, we literally just did it a few weeks ago too. It was on their like kind of all day, 24 hour stream where they just, uh, cycle through all their videos over the years and it showed up and we just started watching it and we watched the end because it was great. It's such a good series and that's what made giant bomb awesome, but they haven't done that in years. So it's a bummer, but that's what I've been playing. That's my thoughts on giant bomb. Um, we'll see where it goes from here with that stuff, but I think I'm going to end this podcast. It's been uh, cathartic, I guess, as uh, a way of uh, wrapping this stuff up. Doing a couple reviews for the games that I've been playing. Like I said, uh, Destroy All Humans. I'm probably going to start to Destroy All Humans 2 tonight. See what that is all about. And I want to do a video on VR uh, because I think it's something fun that I can do that I can put a little bit of uh, time and uh energy into doing something a little bit different and new and creative for this website, gameordie.net, uh, in my podcast. This is for fun. You know, I'm not trying to sell any products. I'm not making money off of this. I'm never going to, I'm just having fun, man. And I want to spread and talk about games to as many people as possible. It's my main and favorite hobby in my life. So if you like reviews, uh, go check out gameordie.net. And if you like this podcast, thank you very much for listening. That's all. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me talk and ramble on about things that I consider important. <laughs> Until next time, I have been your host, Ryan Moore, for the Game or Die podcast. 